And I would um, I will begin today by um, inter by introducing Dr. Shirley Mills, who's with the School of Mathematics and Statistics. Dr. Mills is a member of a of a Canadian research consortium on sports analytics, which is funded by the Canadian Statistical Sciences Institute, CANSI. Dr. Mills is, um, is, works with uh, Olivier Chabot and in consequence will uh, provide introduction for, uh, for Olivier today and will moderate the uh, Q&A at the end of today's presentation. Welcome, Dr. Mills. Thank you and welcome everyone to a talk where statistics meets sports at Carleton University. As mentioned, I'm a professor specializing in statistics and data science in the School of Math and Stat at Carleton. And I'm a member of what is called a collaborative research team on sports analytics, which is a national group. I'm delighted today to introduce today's speaker. He is one of several students who've done research with me on sports analytics as part of their academic program. Olivia Chabot is completing a master's degree in statistics. He's doing a graduate internship on basketball analytics under my direction and in collaboration with the Ravens women's basketball team coaches and members. This academic internship was funded by a Carlton alumnus and his wife who saw it as a unique way to support academic research, to encourage students to learn and apply new analytical skills, and at the same time support a sport that they love. I would love to make Carleton University a center of excellence for analytics in sports. Now, let me turn things over to Olivier to talk about sports analytics, what makes a great basketball shot. And reminder, for your questions, please put them into the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. Olivier, it's over to you. Okay, well, thank, thanks for the introduction. Uh, hello, everyone. I see a few familiar names, a few people from back home. So uh, thanks for attending. Now I'll try to, now that you've came in, I'll try to make you stay and make it provide as much value as possible. All right. Yeah, so what makes a great basketball shot? That's one of the main questions of today's presentation. And the first thing I want to kind of talk about is the journey, because there's going to be a few themes throughout the presentation, but I call it the analytics meandering journey. Um, on the left uh, of the slide, you see a thermometer. That's because I come from Northern Ontario and it's typically a bit colder. So that's where things all started. I played hockey the first uh, 18 years of my life competitively. Well, not competitive when I was young, but eventually. And hockey brought me to Campbell, which is 40 minutes from Ottawa approximately to play junior hockey. And at that point, that was the dream. And then life got in the way. And then, so it was to play hockey in the NHL, all that type of stuff. And then I decided to go full-time, pursue my schooling at 18 in 2014 at Carleton. So I did a bachelor's degree in math. And then I went to teacher's college at Ottawa U in French to uh, be qualified to teach grade seven to 12 in math and physics. And all these details will kind of come together throughout the presentation. And then after teacher's college, I decided to do a, a master's degree in statistics. At first it was psychology or neuroscience or something like that, but then opted for statistics. And then a, a year in my uh, degree, I heard about the position and with Dr. Mills and the Ravens uh, basketball team. And I thought, wow, like that position is made for me. So it's awesome that it's made a reality. And in 2022 here, that's where we are today. And I'm uh, supposed to graduate in the, in the June in June this year. All right. So that's basically the outline. We're going to cover what is a good basketball shot, what makes the ball go in the hoop, future research, takeaways, all that good stuff. So I'll start with a poll for you all. There's uh, all the participants. I'll launch a poll here. What is the most important thing in basketball? Is it A, shooting, B, turnovers? C, rebounding. Rebounding is when you pick up the ball after a shot. Uh, D, free throws. E, having fun. And I'll just wait a minute or so, and then I'll end the poll and, uh, <laughs> and uh, release the, the results here. All right, maybe 10 seconds. Okay, 
share results. Um, everyone but the 22% of the people that said having fun are wrong. <laughs> the answer is having fun. That's the most important thing. Now, the second the most important thing is shooting. Why? Well, let's explore this a bit further. This is a, um, a slide that talks about Dean Oliver. It's, um, he, it's one of the pioneers of statistics, of analytics, basketball analytics in particular. And what you see on this slide is one of the four factors, which is shooting. On the x-axis is your field goal percentage, how well you shoot. So uh, on the left of the slide, you have lower percentage so that you shoot not that well. On the right is you shoot really well. On here is if you win games or not. So if you're above the horizontal line here, that means you won the game. So it's your point differential. So for example, if the score was 102 to 98, then you subtract those two scores, you'd get four points, right? So you'd be four points above. And then if you're under zero, that means that let's say you had 98, well, then you'd be at minus four and so on. So you want to be above the line and to the right, that's good. And then each one of those dots here is a, a basketball game for the women's team in the last five seasons. And in color are the games this season, but basically what you see on the slide is that the more, the better you shoot, the more to the right you are, the more you tend to be above the line. And that makes a lot of sense, right? That the red line that goes across the screen is essentially a trend line and it's roughly linear. Now, obviously there's, there's noise, there's variation, but what you see is the better you shoot, the more you win basketball games. That makes a lot of sense. And what Dean Oliver found was that shooting was the most important factor out of shooting, turnovers, rebounding, and free throws. And that together, those four statistics explain like almost all the who will win the game. If you know those four things, both offensively and defensively, you'll be able to predict the team that won the game the vast majority of time. So if you, if you just take a couple examples here, uh, the team played York twice. Here, um, this, this game, Carlton shot about average, right? It's, it's uh, around 45%. That's about in the middle of their cloud of points. And they lost, they're under the dash line. So they lost by a few points, two points or something like that, right? And so that means that they, they probably um, got outplayed in the turnovers, rebounding free throws, or even the other team just shot better, th things like that, right? There are somewhat independent factors, obviously, if, if you shoot well, you're more likely to do the other things well, but not always. And then the other game, the second game, if you look at the other game against York, they shot way better and they actually uh, won by a lot, like almost 30 points. And if you go back to the first game, they shot under what they were predicted, right? The line is like, on average, they would have shot, they would have won by around 10 points, but they lost by two. So there's, there's some error but the trend is pretty significant. And then if you contrast that with two games against Nipissing, the team actually shot not that well, right? They're on the left of the graph, but they beat them by 30 points or so. So it just goes to show that generally speaking, there's a correlation, but it depends on the other team as well. But if you know both of them, then you're in good shape. So basically from the slide, you can tell that shooting is very important. And that's why I decided to study shooting. The other reason why I decided to study shooting is because of the pandemic. Uh, there was no contact during practices and stuff like that. So uh, shooting was something easy to track. It just happened to be the most important thing. And then you have the, uh, the equation of the line. If you want to get a bit mathy here, this is a y equals mx plus b. Throw back to grade nine math. Hence why I talked about teacher's college. This is the slope. So essentially rise over run. If you uh, run by one, that means you would rise by 1.23 points. So essentially if you shoot by 1% better in your effective field goal percentage, you're gonna win by 1.23 points more. That's, that's what this is saying. Obviously it's not perfect, but let's move on. So now there was two ways, two approaches to figure out what is a good basketball shot. So again, just put your questions in the chat. I'll try to try to keep an eye on it here. 
Um, are those conditions true for, yes. Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, pretty much all the slides, like sure it's with the, the, the women's team, but these slides apply to basically all of basketball past a certain age. Like it, it, it's uh, really general, right? Like I was able to replicate pretty much all the things that they find in the NBA. So that's, that's something good to get out of the way right away. Okay, so now what is a good basketball shot? And the first way to uh, tackle that question is to study the, the big picture. So studying the spatial structure of the game and kind of goes into a shot, like the things that you can look at from without tools. So just like looking at where the players are and stuff like that. And this is a shot chart for the team this year, 2021, 2022. And obviously, uh, it's we're not all the way done. We're not done, done the season, but wait. Well, I have another poll for you here. And should the team shoot more twos or threes? And I give you a hint: the two point percentage is forty five, and the three point percentage is thirty. So I'll launch the poll here. Uh, check in number two. Launch that. Should they shoot more twos or threes? And try to come up with uh, uh, an explanation here. I'll give you 30 seconds or so. Ideally, your explanation would use numbers, but all right. So, and poll, share results. It's, uh, it's kind of uh, split down the middle, right? Five people said two, six people said threes, and eight people said the question is flawed. Well, let's see. I'm, I'm not sure what the answer is. So you can think about it in terms of expected points. So maybe I'll, I'll just do the math with you verbally, and then we can look at this stuff. So let's say I tell you that you're 50% from uh, layups. Layups is where you're right under the, the rim and you just put the ball with one hand. Uh, you make half of them, okay? And then I tell you that you take 100 layups. So you shoot 100 layups, you make half of them. So that means that you're, you're gonna get 50 makes out of 100. And then they're worth two points each. So then two points times 50, that's 100 points. So essentially 100 points times divided by 100 attempts is one point per attempt. And you could get the, the, uh, that number by just multiplying 50% times 200 points, right? Or, or sorry, uh, yeah. So you can essentially multiply the percentage times the uh, point value. So here it'd be 50% times two points, you'd get one. And then 45%, they're 45% this team, times two point, that's 45 times two, that's 90. So 0 0.9 points per, per shot. So on average, if you take a two pointer, you're gonna get 0 0.9 points per two pointer, okay? Obviously it's either you're gonna get, you're never gonna get 0 0.9, you're always gonna get zero or two, but if you add them all up by the, the add all the number of points and then divide by the number of shots, it's gonna be something close to 0 0.9. And then if you do 0.3, because they shot 30% from three, you're going to get 0.3 times three. That's one third of three, which is 0 0.9. Okay. So in terms of efficiency, how, how many points per shot on average will you get? They're actually exactly the same. And I was going to update the shot chart, but I'm like, the, the numbers worked out too nice because otherwise it might be like 9.1 or 0 0.89, something like that. But here they're exactly the same, right? So in terms of efficiency, the taking twos and threes are exactly the same for, for this team at this time. But then there's a few things to keep in mind here. And they're big, pretty big things to keep in mind. The first thing is that not all twos and threes are the same. So for example, if you look at the bubble that popped up on the top left here, the mid, uh, the, the mid range twos went at 38%. So in this section here, if you add all the shots up, your, your accuracy is 38%, but in the short twos, it's 47%. So you see that short twos are better than long twos. 
So not all twos are, are equal, right? So that's a bit pretty big caveat there. And then the second point is obviously you have to take what the other team gives you. If they guard you really tight on the threes, then you might have to attack the rim more. If they don't let you attack the rim, then you might have to space out and take wider shots. So it's not like one size fits all for all teams. And that's kind of one of the main misconceptions in analytics is like twos are better than threes. Well, well, yeah, three is a bigger number than two, but it's it's not that simple, right? Like you need to dig further and it's not a one size fit all silver bullet for every team here. The third thing is that 0 0.9 for both of them is just on average. But that's like if you think of stocks and you're investing in your portfolio, that's your expected returns, like your 5% per year thing. But there's also a risk, right? Like how much does your portfolio do this? Well, twos and threes have a different risk profile. So what I did here is I simulated shots. So that's um, in R, I use R to program. Don't worry about that just yet. But essentially it's like flipping a coin, right? So the, I did that the two point shooter had a 45% shooting percentage, which is what we had earlier. So 45%, so they'll make 45% and they take 100 shots. On the x-axis is the number of shots they took. So you can imagine that 45% of 100 is 45. And then there were two points, so they should get something to 90 points, something close to that. And they got just under, right? And sometimes I'll shoot more than 90, sometimes I'll shoot less. But on average, it's going to be something close to 90. And then in, in blue, in red, sorry, it's the same thing, except it's 30% shooting accuracy for the three-point shooter and then I flip coins and then I flip up the coin of 30 percent times making it and then 70 percent missing it uh, you flip it a hundred times and then the red team got it probably something exactly 90 so the red red shooting team the three-point shooting team won here so if you had a team that just shot threes they would have beat the team that just shot two for this particular sequence of a hundred times, right? But as you know, if you flip coins, it's not gonna be the same thing. So one time doesn't tell the whole story. What we can do here is do this uh, game that we've played a thousand times. So now I do the same thing, except I simulate the, the game a thousand times. So there's actually 2000 lines on this graph. And what you see is that the, the trend is, on average, both strategies result in 90 points, which makes sense. 0 0.9 times 100 is 90. But the, the red team has more risk. So some games, the red team will score a lot more because it's three, right? And then so there, there's more variability. So the some games, the red team is going to do a lot better, but they're also going to do a lot worse. If you look, the blue is kind of all in the middle. All the worst performances are red and all the best performances are red. So now this is another theme of the presentation is with the same data, you can tell a different story or you can tell the same story in a different way. There's different ways to visualize data, which is super important when you communicate statistics and even analyze statistics. So this is kind of the Y axis from the previous chart, which was the point. So this is 90 points. You see that both of them most of the time score something close to 90 points. But then if you look at the extreme here, all the extremes are red. All the extremes are red, right? So shooting just threes is more risky than shooting just twos. And that's, that's a big thing here. And I'll just change my camera because I find I'm looking at the other one more. Okay, so I, if you have questions, that might be, I'll just check the chat here, or maybe I'll just keep going. And then, um, the next thing you can do is a lot of NBA teams. Uh, this is Jay Triano in the top right. He's a famous basketball coach uh, in the NBA. And this is the Minnesota Timberwolves. And they actually have the 0 0.9 number for every spot on the court. And th this is a fake picture, but they have this in their practice gym, uh, like real stickers on the court. So it reminds players of where might be better places to shoot and whatnot. What I want you to notice is that the highest number is from this region here, from the free throw line. Now, it's not because when you shoot from there, you, you're better, you have better accuracy. Note that it's a different color. It's that because when you take free throws, you're about 
because there's no there's no defenders, right? It's just you against the rim. And 80% and you take two free throws usually, 0.8 times two is something close to 1.6, which makes sense why we have 1.6 there, 1.59, right? So that's the best possible outcome for basketball possession is when you get free throws, because you get 0.8 times two, which is 1.6. The second best is when you take the layups, because layups go in at about like 60%, 65% of the time. Like if you're right under the rim, they go in very often. So any shot from the restricted area here, the little crease around the rim, it's about 1.3. So that would be a 65% times two, that's 1.3. And then the third possible best thing is shots around the, the, the arc here, uh, just over a point, or sorry, in the corner threes, that's 1.2. And then after that's around the arc. And then finally, the, the, the least, the last choice, I guess, is the, the mid range. It's not that those shots are bad to take. It's just you have to choose when you, you, you take them. You might want to prioritize the other options before you try to get that as your plan A. So again, there's no silver bullet, but it's a good kind of hierarchy of what's a good shot. Okay, so it's, this is all nice and it's fun to, to talk about and that kind of thing, but it, it's hard to collect data, right? You kind of have to rely on Synergy and other sources to collect data. So I'm a big Desmos fan. It's for those of you who took, you went to high school in the last like maybe five, 10 years, you probably worked with Desmos. I actually am wearing my Desmos shirt right now. My friends got it made for me because I use and talk about Desmos all the time, but it's basically an online calculator. I built a basketball court in Desmos and I made a little GIF thing um, that you can drag that point and then you can get the x y coordinates to start tracking and studying shots you can see the distance from the rim and whatever one thing i want to point out is that this is an nba size court so if you look at the three point line here the sidelines they're higher than a fiba court and the ravens uh, in u sports they use fiba basketball court so again i had to rebuild something else and I did that using the Easy Stats app that you see on the top left. I've worked with the developer, um, and now you have a FIBA basketball court. So that's pretty exciting. It's useful for all the coaches, super easy to use. I made video tutorials on how to use it as well. You can create shot charts. Um, this, I created this shot chart. I'm using R, and this is all practice data. And practice data, there is, uh, 4,200 shots, 400, uh, 4,195 shots. And you can see that's roughly the same sp spatial structure as the game data. So basically what this is telling you that like, the, if you study practice shots, it's close enough to game shots that you can still start to get some uh, meaningful patterns. And yeah, so I, I built this using R, specifically the tidyverse and there's all kinds of spatial um, packages and that kind of thing. I did a whole directed studies in geomatics. So it's essentially the study of spatial statistics with Dr. Murray Richardson to learn this type of stuff. But we can talk about that in the questions if you're more interested. Spatial statistics is kind of its own field and super useful. When you think about it, almost all data is spatial, but the uh, traditional training, you don't learn that, that, that much about spatial statistics. And why bother doing all of this? It's because you once you built your own thing or you have a functional tool, you have your x, y coordinates, you can do a bunch of things. And you can look at by distance, you can do zones, you can look at by angle, you can imagine that maybe from the right side they're better, something like that. And you can look at both, right? Kind of like split it up by distance and angle, see which zone, the percentages and all kind of thing. It unlocks a lot of research possibilities. You can create cool maps to try to answer uh, where did we shoot from. That's the whole team, the, the 4,200 shots. You see that the right layups are pretty popular, left layups a little bit less, uh, left corner three, that type of thing. But that, that's general with um, all basketball teams, by the way. It's like those five spots and layups are very popular. Back in the day, you might see more uh, mid-range shots, but the trend has been going down less mid-range shots. You can create um, charts for each player. So yeah, I'll just let you look at them a bit. 
the top three players, as you can see, um, have similar shooting patterns. There's a bit of differences. So player 12 here might take more right layups. Uh, player 13, more shots from a little bit further. And uh, you look at uh, the, the shots on top of the arc, more shots from the right wing. This player is more shots from the left wing, left wing as well. And then the bottom three players probably play a different position, right? They probably play closer to the rim. This player loves the right rim, uh, right layups. This player likes the left layups and is very concentrated uh, on the right layups and so on, right? So you, you can kind of create a bunch of different pictures and get some interesting insights just from, oh, I didn't realize I'm taking most of my shots from there when the coach wants me to shoot from a different spot or vice versa, right? And the beauty of this thing is that to go from the team chart to the player's chart, you just need to add the little line of code here in, in our facet wrap till the player, and then it creates per player. So using R unlocks a lot of research um, uh, possibilities, and it makes things reproducible because it's it's not drag and drop. I, I, I don't have to recreate these charts by hand every time. I just run the script that I type once, and then I can use it forever and share it with other people. Okay, this is one of the most important pictures in the presentation, and I would argue in basketball analytics in general. This is done with practice data, but it applies like NBA charts look pretty close to the same, NCAA charts, I've looked at those too, look pretty close to the same. What you see is on the x-axis, you have the distance from the net, the rim. So on the left, you're right under the zero, that would be your right under the rim, um, five feet, uh, just under five feet is the restricted area, which is a little crease thing around the rim. And then 22, 23 feet is the three point line, right? And what you, on the Y axis is the shooting percentage. Th this region in blue is worth two points. And then once you're past the three point line, it's worth three points, okay? So what you see is that the shooting percentage right under the rim is something between like 70, like 80, 90, like there's not that much data, right? Like here you see all the shots, the 4,000 shots, but anywhere like after one foot, you're still at 75 and then that drops plummets from 80 to 40. So you almost lose 40 percentage points within the first five feet, which is kind of not everyone would know that, right? Like it's not obvious that the, the shooting percentage drops by that much. You, you see a, a steep decrease and then after that, it kind of levels off. And then when you start getting really far, then you can imagine that like, if you take really long threes, your percentage might drop a bit, but the, the percentage is fairly similar. So now if you look at, this is kind of the main, the main uh, area of concern for the chart. It, this is worth two points and you're shooting about 40%, so that'd be like a 0 0.8 points per shot. This is three points and you're still at 40%. So that's 1.2 points per shot. You, you will see a big increase. So now if we keep the same chart, but the only thing we change is the Y axis. Instead of shooting percentage, we multiply that red line by two points for the blue area and then by three points for the uh, yellow orange area. So we're gonna get the expected points here. So again, here it was 0 0.8 times two. So that's why we're at 1.6. And what you see is now you have a big jump at the three point line, right? Because it was the same percentage, but it's worth an extra three points. And the reason we have that little gap here is because, you know, um, I think in geometry, it's like the thing that you split and then you turn, the, I think it's called a compass or compo in, uh, in French, but yeah. So like if you had a compass and then you spun it, it would be here, right? So like the distance of 20, 23 feet or whatever it is would be here, but most players shoot within this. So that's why you kind of have a spike, but that, that's, that's not the end of the world. The, the idea is that um, when you shoot from three and you have the same percentage, you're better off taking that step back, right? Okay, so now we know that distance affects shooting percentage. Most of the percentage is lost in the first few feet. And after that, it's pretty stable. What about the side of the court, right? 
You can imagine that a right layup, that's your dominant hand for most players. It's something like 90% of players are right-handed. Might go in more often than the left layup because you're not using the right footing, the right hand and whatever. But when you look at all the shots, this is on, on the right side. So 90 degrees, that would be, for example, from the right corner three. N negative 90 degrees would be from the left corner three, for example. You see that there's a bit of... Uh, increase, but it's it's not obvious. The the trend isn't as obvious as the, the the distance, and you have to think like shooting like this on one side versus shooting like this on one side is completely different, right? Because when you shoot with two hands, it might not matter what side of the court you're on. So what I'm going to do next is look at the shots, the one-handed shots, the shots that you're probably shooting with one hand. So the distance is less than eight feet here. And we could shrink it down to four feet. It doesn't matter. Once you have the data, you can shrink it down. And I'm guessing you might see more of an effect. So we don't have all the shots. We only have 17-ish, 100 shots. And you see that the shots from the side go in uh, more than in, in the, uh, like, uh, that would be zero. And then that would be 45. That would be 90. So in the middle and on the sides, you tend to see uh, a higher percentage. On the right side, there's probably a higher percentage. But the trend isn't super, super duper obvious, but maybe like we need more data. There's a lot of uncertainty here, right? It's not obvious that one side is better than the other. So conservative prediction here. And as expected, or I guess as hypothesized, when you shoot with two hands, so more than eight feet, there's no difference in shooting percentage whatsoever. So whether you shoot on the left side versus the right side of the court, makes no difference whatsoever. You're always around 38, 40%, whatever it is. Okay, so that, that's kind of interesting. There, there's more uh, angle has uh, an effect the closer you are to the rim, essentially. So there's an interaction between angle and uh, shot distance, which is interesting, but shot distance is still very robust effect here. And basically what we're building up to right now is that in theory, you could track where the player is shooting from. So, so the distance and the angle from the rim to track a bunch of things and then say, this, this is a good shot because the player has a 80% of making it, right? Versus this is a bad shot because um, there was a defender right there. It was off balance. He just got, the, the player just kind of shot at the rim without uh, trying to score, right? So you can track all these things and get, get a shot quality measure, a probability of making the shot. So I'll just play the video. All features. We looked at every shot. We can see where is the shot? What's the angle to the basket? Where are the defenders standing? What are their distances? What are their angles? For multiple defenders, we can look at how the player is moving and predict the shot type. We can look at all their velocities, and we can build a model that predicts what is the likelihood that, that this shot would go in so, under these circumstances? What they do here, this is the company Second Spectrum. It's the company that works with the NBA. They use computer vision. So that's a computer watching the games. And it does all that for you. It's not me with the iPad putting a point on the screen, a bunch of error and all that type of stuff. But they can measure the player's speeds. And it's amazing. There's trackers in the player's equipment. I think it's in their jerseys and a tracker in the ball. And you can figure out a bunch of things. So it, my research is, is essentially, essentially trying to recreate some of these findings without having the equipment, right? And, and having those insights. features. We looked at every shot. Right. We can see so once where you is have this. This is only when you plug in uh, these charts. Are the chart on the left is the shooting percentage given a specific location. So essentially, if you give me the x y coordinates in this region. You plug them in the formula, the computer does beep, boop, beep, 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 boop, and then it shoots out 70%. This shot, on average, regardless of who it is, for the 4,187 shots, on average, I'll be 70%. Obviously, not all shots are made equal. That's why you can add more variables, but we don't have that technology yet. You need kind of computer vision or intense uh, manual training. And even there, there's always error, that type of stuff. 70%, right? And you can see that on the right side of the rim, the, the region is a bit brighter. So there's higher percentage than the left side. And then after that, the percentage is almost all the same. 
it's all 40%. So you, again, if you connect it back to the distance and angle charts, there, uh, the, the percentage drops steeply. So that this is this drop, right? 70, 60, 40, uh, 50, and then 40 the rest of the way. And there was a bit of angle, like the left side, right side, and so on. But these numbers aren't perfect. In fact, they're far, far, far from being perfect. There's error, right? There's uncertainty. So on the right side is this model error. You can try to get um, the computer to tell you how confident are you about this? And confidence is kind of a bad word in statistic, but it's, a, it's error, it's uncertainty, right? So in black is all the shots where they happen. And what you see is that there's less error. Here, there's only three standard errors. Right, so that's most of the shots, like your, your percentage that I gave you 70, that would be plus minus one standard error. So that'd be, for example, 67 to 73, something in that range, but two standard errors if you wanna be more conservative or three standard errors, right? So let's say if you go three standard errors, it'd be uh, minus nine plus nine. So 61, 79 in that range, you'd be pretty confident, right? And then in these regions, you have, and a very high standard error. You have 13 and 11, well, why? Well, you don't have shots, right? So if I tell you to predict something you've never seen before, how can you even make an educated guess? And so, oh, that's called extrapolating, right? You have data and then you predict something that's not in your data. And usually it's a big no-no. So what we can do is we can try to only show, again, same data, different story by communication, only show the spots that don't have that much error. So what, this is what you see. So on the left chart, you see the 70, 50, 60, 50 again, but the places where there was a lot of error, we don't show them because it's probably not meaningful, right? And you could play around this. I chose a standard error of less than 0 0.5. So that'd be like plus minus five if you go one standard error and you still get lots of Swiss cheese in there, lots of holes, right? And then on the right side, you, what you see is we multiply those percentages times the number of points and we get the expected points value. So if you look at 70, for example, or yeah, 70 times two, that should be around 1.4. That's what you see. If you look at 40 times two, that should be around 0 0.8. And that's what you see. And what's the big difference? Again, same data, just showed a different way. Well, now the three point range comes alive, right? Because it's worth that extra point. It's kind of the graph where it was all equal. And then when you do times the number of points, well, it jumps up. Well, this is the jump at the three point line. And the way I did this is if you see, this is actually like little pixel. I split up the cord and uh, I think I use five centimeters by five centimeters. So it's like almost like two inches by two inches, something like that, right? And then you, you plug that in the formula. So you can imagine how many Five, uh, five by five centimeters squares there is on the court, but the computer does all that work for, for us. So that's, that's what's nice about learning to code. Okay, so the first approach was looking at the big features, the macro, the spatial, right? What goes in before the shot, the nearest defender, all, all uh, the, the distance from the rim and all of that. But then the second aspect we can do is what comes after the shot, the micro I call, or the ballistics or the shooting mechanics of a basketball shot. So this is um, a company, NOAA Basketball, that the NBA teams work with. They put a camera, a sensor above the rim. The, the camera is able to put a point that you see uh, where, where they shoot from, and if like red if they miss, green if they make. But they can also create a rim chart, which was never done in basketball before. So since the camera is above, you can see where the ball lands within the rim. So these would be short shots. This would be long shots. This would be right, like they, they miss right. This would be left. And then you can do all kinds of cool stats. So I'll just play the video and then we can talk about that. NOAA provides instant audible feedback for every shot's entry position, left or right of center. Five. Your shot arc, 45, or your shot depth in the hoop, nine, allowing players to correct their shot in the real time. Thing with Noah is that there's actually a speaker on the wall that, as the players are shooting, let's say you want to work on your shot arc, it tells you 
oh, this is 45 degrees, this is 46 degrees. So let's say you want to aim for a specific number, it corrects you in real time, right? You miss left by two inches, right by two inches. So that's really cool because it's one thing to do the, the, the stats, but if you tell the player two days on the road, like, oh, by the way, you shot two degrees too, too high, like, the player doesn't care, right? It doesn't change their behavior and they can't get better at shooting if you don't give them the data right away. So I'll just play that. And then I tried to apply my uh, physics knowledge from teacher's college. I used a software called Tracker a video analysis and modeling tool. It's free. And what this does is you take a video. So that's the pairs drill that they do in practice. Uh, it's just one player shooting from usually the three point line and then the other player rebounds. And then the software, you put the video in the software and a video is just a series of pictures, right? And let's say you're 30 frames per second. Um, and then you have a shot is like, let's say three seconds. Well, then you'd have 90, three times 30, you'd have 90 pictures in a row. And then the software splits up that video on those 90 pictures and you just take your mouse and click at the center of the ball, right? So you can imagine how that's very tedious to do a bunch of shots and I won't be able to be like the speaker like 45 degrees in real time. And that's why you need things like computer vision and innovation and better tools to do these types of things, but you can still get decently cool results here. Recently, Carlton installed a camera above the rim. So you can, again, use it, put that in tracker and put the, the origin at the center of the circle and put dots where the ball landed. It's always at the center of the ball. And then once you do this, you can create some cool things like this. You, this is uh, 10 shots from the player that you saw in the video. And you see that the red, uh, flight paths are misses, the green are makes. And you see that all of her misses were short and probably due to too much arc, right? Like all the red shots are the ones with the most arc. And you can imagine that if you shoot too arky, well, you also need to put more force into it. So the initial velocity of the ball needs to be higher. Otherwise, it'll land. So if you shoot straight up and you don't put force, well, it'll land straight down. I mean, that's the extreme example, right? And I put this in orange down here because NOAA, their softwares are a little bit everywhere and they track 361 million shots. I, it took me like five hours to track 10 shots, but they track 360 and counting, right? They, they keep adding to their databases. And what they found, was that for shots that are decently far out, so like free, free, um, free throw line and further, the optimal release angle and landing, landing angle, that's what they study, but it's close to the same as the release angle, is 45 degrees. So when you have the speaker on the wall, you can, be, uh, you can get the, the feedback like 45 degrees and get that reinforced and always try to keep your consistency around 45, right? And then the other thing that they found is that most players try to aim in the middle of the rim, but according to data, whatever that means, uh, the, the highest percentage of shots that go in is it, two inches past the center of the rim. So that's kind of uh, unintuitive for some, right? Shooting past the center, and that's kind of like if you take your, your glass here, and this is the rim, let's say, well, if you tilt it, the, the, the center of that openness is going to be past the center. That's kind of how you can think about it. And it makes sense when you, when you think about it. But this is her 10 shots. Uh, in green are the makes. So you see that they're all in the middle. And the, this player missed short twice. And uh, sh well, short three times, two left, and one right. And you can kind of create these um, charts, which is cool. You can get to see different types of patterns to inform players. This is kind of the sweet spot. You want your shot to be centered, of course, and a little bit past the middle. Um, Noah has this thing that they call the guaranteed make zone. So you can kind of try to draw a circle around all the green points. And that would be like, if you shoot the center of the ball in this zone, you're going to make it 100% uh, of the time. But uh, obviously it's, even when you know that, it's hard to shoot that with the right angle and all these things. So NOAA is very powerful because most, uh, this is the parish drill for, for the team and uh, the dates increased here. 
and the, the cumulative shooting percentage is because the, there's thousands and thousands of shots. They do the, they do this pair, pair drill um, uh, all the time, like almost every practice. And at, at some point you're going to plateau, right? It's hard to get, to keep getting better. And sometimes may, maybe it, I, they say that it's proven to make you better at shooting. I, I, I want to see the research on that. But if you have biofeedback, at least you have the information of what you need to do. It helps you be more deliberate in your practice, which has been shown to be one of the only things to break through plat plateaus, right? And then, so that's on the team level. Uh, when they shoot from the three-point line, they plateau out around 52, whatever. And then when they shoot just inside the three-point line, they, they plateau at around 60. So it makes sense because you're closer to the rim. And yeah, you're gonna plateau eventually and there's things you can do to get out of that plateau. You can look at kind of a, a race to the top for the players, the, the shooting percentage. And generally speaking, it doesn't take that long for the hierarchy to form. And after that, like after a month or so, like the, the bars won't change that often as because there's thousands and thousands of shots, right? Like having one good practice doesn't change much when you have 10,000 shots in your sample. Okay, future research. Uh, I started tracking nearest defender. So in blue is the shooter and red is the, the, the defender. You can see that shots at the rim are more closely guarded than three point shots, generally speaking, but also that an extra foot of distance at the rim is worth more than an extra foot of distance at the three point line. And you can imagine why everything's tighter, right? So that's future research. But again, it's, it, I use the Easy Stats app to track this, and it's not made for that. So better tools would be beneficial. A big area of interest for me is if we had tracking data, then I can start looking at spacing. Because I think most sports and most things in life are uh, spatial processes that di like this. And once we develop better techniques to analyze it, you, you can see that, that uh, the points move in time and how specific shapes uh, might increase your shooting percentage and so on, right? Because basketball is big on spacing. The more you increase the area of your pentagon, the, the more the, this, the defenders have to chase you and it, in, uh, it creates space and makes creates better shots, right? So you can start studying this, but again, we need better data. We oui, takeaways, I have two minutes left-ish and then I'm all yours. Summary that well, what have we learned? The first thing is that shooting is king. Um, it's the statistic, the first factor. It explains about 40% of point differential. That's what Dean Oliver found. Um, some shots are more efficient than others. So again, if you keep kind of keep uh, remembering it's a percentage times the point value, um, you're gonna see that it's not three is always better, right? Like layoffs are better than threes for the most part and so on. And there's trade-offs in everything. So there's no silver bullet. There's always uncertainty. You have to take what they give you. And um, statistics are, are there to inform you and to, to describe situations. And um, I think that this will lead into the next slide. But that the one, one thing I've learned is that communication is king as a statistician or analyst. It, and I, I tried to not put math too much math in the presentation, but kind of keep it light with pictures and, and fun. And uh, yeah, when you communicate with the coaches and players, it's super important to always talk about uncertainty and question your results and try to make some nice visuals. That's, that's a big thing. Keep, keep words simple. It's because I, I could have came here and said, oh, we use machine learning AI to make data-driven uh, whatever algorithms, right? Big words doesn't mean much. Okay. So the second thing is, I, I found great success in applying your unique straight strengths to your craft. So whatever you're good at, whatever your baggage, at first I kind of saw it as a crutch that I wasn't a pure um, math person that, that come into this. A lot of people have way stronger stats background, but you can find ways to apply, uh, to refine what you do to accommodate your skill set and find success within your own little niche, right? And the, the third thing is, honestly, the co-op, this opportunity was the best thing to, the, that could have happened for my master's. Best way to learn is to do and teach. So that's kind of what I'm doing now. Um, 
way better than taking courses, applying it to real life tests, your ideas and whatnot. And finally, I have a bunch of people to thank. Uh, the audience, thank you for showing up. Really appreciate it. The future audience, I'm talking to future people right now on YouTube. So thank you for talking. Thank you for the polls. That was fun for me, at least. Uh, the alumni donors, it's amazing that I can get paid to do this. I don't need to say more on that. I think that's awesome and get credits. Dr. Mills for making this position a reality and moderating this talk. The Ravens team, our organization as a whole, top notch, only good things to say, and it's a privilege to work with them. And thanks for putting up with me. Uh, Murray Richardson, who did the directed studies uh, to learn spatial statistics, big thank you. Zach Frager from the Easy Stats app to build the FIBA court uh, in collaboration, big thank you. And I'll see anyone else. And in closing, started with the presentation with talking about the NHL. That was my dream. Well, there's two conferences. Surely we'll, Dr. Mills will talk more about it. There's the Ottawa Hockey Analytics and the Big Data Cup, but there's many roads that lead to the NHL and who knows, who knows, right? So I'll, I'll leave it with that and then we can, uh, I'll, I'll stop sharing and then we can uh, jump into the questions. Thanks, Olivier. Uh, can you put up that last slide? Because I, I do want to uh, have people uh, take a look at that last link. Is so it first up, of all, I want to thank you very much, Olivier, for a, a very fun and interesting presentation. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you do this internship. And uh, I, I just wish you all the best as you're graduating. Uh, Olivia has shown us how much fun you can have combining statistics, mathematics, computing, and your sport, uh, sport of interest. And just to look at how, the, how you can use analytics to analyze and impact sports. I, I wanna thank everybody for attending this Science Cafe and as very special thanks to our, our, our Carleton University donors for making these internships possible. They have funded an endowment that is, is allowing us to, um, offer two paid internships each term. For more sports analytics on the screen, you'll see that Olivier has a link. And it's to www.statsportsconsulting.com slash OTTHAC22. That's the Ottawa Hockey Analytics Conference. We started these in 2015. Um, we only missed one year and that was the, the first year of the pandemic when we couldn't hold the conference. We are holding it again this year. It's coming up March 25 and 26. Registration is free. Is free. If you go to that link, you can register. You can also see uh, the program. We are in the, in the process of uh, finalizing the program actually. Along with the Hockey Analytics Conference, which is an international conference, we had over 470 uh, registrants last year. Uh, along with that conference, last year we inaugurated the Big Data Cup, um, which is similar to like the Big Data Bowl for football, but we've done the Big Data Cup for hockey. It was the first year for that, and we offer prizes um, for uh, competitors in two uh, series. There's a college university competition and an open competition. We are going to again have the Big Data Cup this year. The data will be released at OHAC 22, March 25-26. And we'll also be holding workshops on how to work with this type of data. So I, I encourage you, if you're interested in these sorts of things, if you want to see more sports analytics, uh, please register. It's free and we have a lot of fun doing this. And now I, I know we have some questions, uh, Olivier, so perhaps we can turn to those. You're sure. up to it. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, there's a bunch here. Um, I'll kind of go through them in the uh in the q a perhaps uh can you explain how to define effective field goal percentage uh that's the like right, field, uh, field, sorry field goal percentage is essentially if you make 22 shots out of 100 then your field goal percentage is going to be 22 percent per cent means per 100 cent is 100 in french but then effective field goal percentage is that uh you you um, you weigh a little bit more the three point shots because they're worth a little bit more, right? So if you made um, 22, uh, 22 two pointers, 
then you, you do that. But then let's say you make five threes on the side, then you do plus five times 1.5 and then divide by the total number of attempts. So you put more weight on the three point makes because they're worth more points. Um, all right. And Shirley, feel free to interject. I can just go through them if that's what's best, but. <laughs> um yeah someone asked an anonymous attendee uh, is this event being recorded where can we find the recording the uh the answer is yes and it'll be posted on the site carlton science cafe youtube channel so that's uh that should be good and i'm not sure when um, um, but i'm thinking probably somewhere around a week from now um can you elaborate on the data set itself? What is the structure, attributes? How do you collect them? Um, I can show you the iPad. So the team got an iPad. Um, I just have the Easy Stats app. Uh, you can just Google Easy Stats basketball. I just go on the app. And then uh, you probably can't see much, but on the app, and then I put uh, there's a basketball court and then I put like two point make and then I, I put a point on the court and then you can export it as a CSV. So your attributes would be if it was made or missed, the player from um, X, Y and the time of the game and all those fun things. But mainly it's the X, Y coordinates, the player and uh, whether the shot was made. With, with just that amount of data, you can do a lot of fun things. Um, how did you create the basketball court graph chart for visualization? Well, that took me a long, long time uh, to get it. Uh, so it looks decent and was functional. Uh, short answer, it's ggplot in R. You can create lines, polygons. And then after I took a course on spatial statistics, I started using the SF package because it's made for spatial data. And then you can have... Uh, you can do more uh, functional things. So for example, on the last slide, I can just show you of the this one for spacing. Let's say I ask you uh, a question like, how many of the Carlton players are within the op opponent's team Pentagon? If you do that using ggplot and classic R, you're going to have to do a lot of if-then statements. But if you do that using uh, the SF package or something similar with spatial data. You can do, there's functions written for you like within Polygon or I don't know them off the top of my head to be honest, but so it's a, it's a better tool for the job and I'm sure there's even better tools for the job. It's just, I'm, I'm kind of figuring out this as I go, right? I didn't know how to code at the beginning of my master's. So again, you can see that do, the best way to learn is by doing, I see that's 2.30. Did we want to close the webinar and then uh, keep answering the questions or what should we do from here? You can keep, um, you can continue, Olivier. There are a lot of good questions. Um, people that do have to go can go, but we will uh, continue to record and capture um, all content um, for uh, review after today. And we'll be sharing out the recording. Yeah. So continue on. All right. Um, okay. So David asked, uh, do you have any sense of what co the cost would be to implement a data tracking system such as NOAA in the gymnasium? Uh, we do because we've looked into it. I think it'd be awesome. Um, I, I can't give you the exact numbers, but it's something like you have a sensor at each net. And you, if you have a main court, Carlton has a, a main court and then a bunch of nets on the side. But if, let's say you have one at each net, I think it'd be somewhere like five six thousand dollars us to get and carlton would need to um install it themselves and all and all that like the school needs to install it themselves noah just ships you the hardware and noah owns the hardware so you essentially just pay for the service and then you pay a hundred us per month i think for access to noah lytics which is um their databases and uh, like the, the shot maps and all of that now, is it worth it? I mean, data in itself is never worth it, right? Like if you don't do anything with data, tracking makes you feel good, makes you feel in control, but it's only what you do out of it. And in terms of 
how uh like is this part of the like 80 20 like is this part of 20 percent of things you should focus on uh in basketball probably not right like the coaches do already like most of the important things could this make your team better could this make specific players better especially players that are just struggling with shooting consistency yes I, I i would bet on that but again it'd be nice if noah would have their their research published like does it if you um if you take two players that are roughly similar or two groups of players one with the no one one with just normal uh, shooting drills does the noah group shoot better if yes how much do they get better right like how much more do they get better like i would like to see those studies so i i want to push for it just because it's cool statistically but in terms of how useful it is it, it's hard to tell but i would bet it, i would bet it's useful and as a player i would like uh i would like to have that and for the record i don't play basketball uh hockey background so that take everything i say with a grain of salt uh leo and the, the questions uh, how does shooting impact impact what defense does how the game is played does improve three-point shooting not do more than just get you extra points is it yes so it stretches the defense by drawing them out and then creating more uh, opportunities drive inside the, the basket and high percentage shots so i'll actually combine that question because i saw um someone else uh ask a similar question earlier um yeah so uh, rima in the chat asked how do you think players like Steph Curry, James Harden have changed basketball and analytics with three-point shooting? With their popularity and uh, rise in analytics, do you think the future of basketball will solely, solely rely on three-point shooting and layups? And short answer to that is I probably not. Probably not. And why? I actually just read an article on that that like, and that makes sense to me is once it's technically it's good to think about it i think in terms of investing and portfolios and that type of stuff is like once there's an inefficiency in the market there's a place where people don't know that a strategy is better then you can take advantage of it but once the market has adapted then the defense is going to guard more of the threes and then it might be good to go back to mid-range shooting right like you might take advantage of teams like the the weak spot of defense will now be something something else. So that the market is constantly evolving. So maybe I'll always be like I'll all be threes and layups. That's kind of what it is right now. It's like if you did the percentage of shots from three, and some teams take more than half of their shots from three, and then layups, and then maybe like 10 or 20% from the mid-range. That's kind of what it is right now, right? But how far will that go? You can't go all the way. I don't think so, because eventually the mid-range is going to be your best shot. Uh, Ali, how much does analytics weigh into coaches, Coach Sinclair's game plan and player development? Uh, I'll, I'll let Danny, uh, Coach Sinclair, answer that. But what I can say is we, we have some good conversations. <laughs> and um, you kind of have to gain the coach's trust so analytic, like I've been kind of saying that from the start, analytics is analytics. It, it, it does a lot of good things and you, you need to keep it like, don't stretch too far, right? Like, so keep, keep it simple, keep it useful for the coaches and you'll, you'll be, you'll be in good shape. I think. Uh, Rima, uh, I, an I answered that one and Richard, uh, great presentation. Love the graphics. Uh, Richard is my, my friend from school. Uh, do you know if some teams are using these statistics in real times uh, to make game decisions? I think, like I'm, I read somewhere that you're not allowed to use NOAA during games. So that's kind of interesting. Like you're not allowed to track. Let's say you have a sensor in your home gym. You're not allowed to track the other the opponents and then figure out like, oh, this player has this, whatever. So um not not really but second spectrum however the media like you might there, there's clips where you see a player running and there's like the percentage like as they're running so if they slow down and they get ready to shoot you might see their percentage go up and so in, in that sense like absolutely yes uh second spectrum is being used in every game every practice how accurate is the position of a given shot how do you account for shots taken 
Yeah, so Daniel here, how accurate and how do you account for a shot taken on the move? Great question. And that's, again, that's something we need better tools for. How accurate? I don't know the exact error. I would have to do a, I guess the way you would figure that out is look at my data set and look, because I track it live during practice. So I kind of try to look at the center of mass of the player as soon as the ball leaves their hand but it happens fast and it's my eyes looking at the player and then looking at the tablet and then taking my pen and then putting a dot there. So I would say for, for layups, there's probably an, an accuracy like plus minus like a radius of uh, one foot, maybe max three feet around. But for three point shots, for example, there's a bit more error because like I'm getting better at tracking. So the error I think has decreased, but uh, there's less pointers. Like there's less lines in, in the three point area. So you kind of have to like look at the lines, like let's say the elbow here that, that you see, this is called the elbow of the court. And I, like, let's say they take a shot from here. So I've gotten good at like, is it okay? Is it under this line? Is it above this line? So those there's a lot more error. There's not that much error the distance from the three point line but there's a lot of uh, lateral error or like angle error, I guess, maybe a better way to do it. How do you account for players while they're on the move? Well, sometimes a player will be horizontal and then they make a layup. And you kind of just like either when their feet left the, the floor or I try to put like the center of mass or so like somewhere in the middle, but it's not a perfect thing, right? And if you look at Noah, for example, they look at the rim maps, but when they make bank shots, like you made the shot, but you missed really far. And most players, when they make a bank shot, it's luck. It's not intentional. So there's all kinds of, in theory, it's all nice, but in, in practice, you need to be aware of those odd events that might skew your, your answers. Uh, Ada, great presentation. When did you start collecting the data? Um, I, I did it using pen and paper and stuff for a while, pretty much right away. And using like shot charts and that type of stuff, but using the app, I think it was something started the position in October, 2020, I think. And then January, somewhere probably after Christmas or right before Christmas. So like January, 2021 started using easy stats. So, and there was no contact the year before. So no contact means that it was mostly like uh, drills that is just skill and uh, the players move, but there's no defenders. So it's not like a real game. So I tracked a bunch of sh shots using that, but when there's no defender and you're just standing there and taking shots, well, obviously your percentage is going to be higher, right? Like some players make 80% of their three point shots when they're just standing there getting a pass and shooting. That's that's incredible, but in game, the, a really good three point shot percentage is like forty percent. So practice versus game is something different. But then in uh, practice, that's like game like data. That's still like the percentage are slightly higher, but not that much. It's actually like very similar. And uh, trying to think, that might be it. I, I think so. I don't see anything else in the Q&A or I believe in the chat, Olivier. So with that, I thank you very much. This has been a great presentation. Um, I think uh, it was uh, very relevant. People love the information. Uh, for those that are still with us, remember the Hockey Analytics Conference on the end of March. I've dropped uh, those uh, links into the chat and we'll be sharing those links out um, when we share out the recording of today's session to all registrants. So keep an eye out for that. Thank you so much again, Olivier, and uh, hope to connect again in the short term. Okay. Thank Bye. you. Thanks everyone.